sung, um, I'm always reminded of um, a man I knew in my childhood. His name was Jimmy Buchanan. And uh, Jimmy was, uh, before he was saved, a, 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 an alcoholic and a desperate alcoholic at that. And um, he came to the wee mission hall that we attended as a family and he was wonderfully saved. And uh, such was the effect of alcohol on his body that um, he could barely speak. He had a really gruff, um, difficult voice to to listen to, and yet God wonderfully saved him and renewed him. I, I suspect as a result of the effect of alcohol in his body, he didn't live into his old age, um, but that was his favourite hymn. And if ever he asked for a hymn, Jimmy Buchanan always asked, for love lifted me when no one but Christ could help. Love lifted me, and just that great reminder of his life and testimony and the truth of that wonderful song. So thank you for that, and uh, thank you for having me back. Um, last week, we looked at the early life of Jacob, <clears throat> and tonight I'd like us to go now into, well, what was the beginnings of his old age? And maybe if you have a Bible, you would turn with me to Genesis chapter 35, and uh, we'll pick up our text there. It's not such a long chapter, and uh, if you will, I think we have a little time, so let me read it to you. It's um, Genesis 35, and uh, I'm reading in the NIV. Then God said to Jacob, go up to Bethel and settle there and build an altar there to God who appeared to you when you were fleeing from your brother Esau. So Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, get rid of the foreign gods you have with you and purify yourselves and change your clothes. Then come, let us go to Bethel, where I will build an altar to God who answered me in the day of my distress and who has been with me wherever I've gone. So they gave Jacob all the foreign gods they had and the rings in their ears. And Jacob buried them under the oak at Shechem. Then they set out and the terror of God fell upon the towns all around them so that no one pursued them. Jacob and all the people with him came to Luz, that is Bethel in the land of Canaan. There he built an altar and called the place El Bethel because it was there that God revealed himself to him when he was fleeing from his brother. Now Deborah, Rebecca's nurse, died and was buried under the oak below Bethel. So it was named Alon Bekuth. After Jacob returned from Paddan Aram, God appeared to him again and blessed him. God said to him, your, your name is Jacob, but you will no longer be called Jacob. Your name will be Israel. So he named him Israel. And God said to him, I am God Almighty, be fruitful and increase in number. A nation and a community of nations will come from you and kings will come from your body. The land I gave to Abraham and Isaac, I will also give to you and I will give this land to your descendants after you. Then God went up from him at that place where he talked with him. Jacob set up a stone pillar at the place where God had talked with him and poured out a drink offering on it. On it. He also poured out oil on it. Jacob called the place where God had talked with him Bethel. Then they moved on from Bethel. While they were still some distance from Ephrath, Rachel began to give birth and had great difficulty. As she was having great difficulty in childbirth, the midwife said to her, don't be afraid for you have another son. As she breathed her last, for she was dying, she named her son Ben-Oni, but his father named him Benjamin. So Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephrath, that is Bethlehem. Over her tomb, Jacob set a pillar, and to this day the pillar marks Rachel's tomb. Israel moved on again and pitched his tent beyond Migdal Edar. While Israel was living in that re region, Reuben went in and slept with his father's concubine Bilhah, and Israel heard of it. 
Jacob had 12 sons, the sons of Leah, Reuben, the firstborn of Jacob, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun, the sons of Rachel, Joseph, and Benjamin, the sons of Rachel's maidservant, Bilhah, Dan, and Naphtali, the son of Leah's maidservant, Zilpah, Gad, and Asher. These were the sons of Jacob who were born to him in Padam Aram. Jacob came home to his father Isaac in Mamre near Kiriath Arbor, that is Hebron, where Abram and Isaac had stayed. Isaac lived 180 years. Then he breathed his last and died and was gathered to his people. Old and full of years and his and Jacob buried with him. It's said that men have three ages. There is youth, there is middle age, and there's you're looking wonderful. And uh, I suspect looking at the screen, some of us have reached the you're looking wonderful stage. I know I have. Um, having certainly left my middle age now and uh, entering into my older years, my old age. And that was the stage that Jacob found himself. We're now entering Jacob's old age. And life hadn't been particularly easy for him. You just need to read the chapter that precedes this. And there's a pretty ugly incident um, in Shechem where his daughter, Dinah goes into town. Um, I think many years ago, I preached a sermon on that. I entitled it, Debra, uh, Dinah Goes Clubbing. And she went into town, and you can read the story for yourself. It's a rather ugly one. And Jacob's sons um, take revenge on the men of Shechem for the way that they abused their sister. And uh, there's a slaughter there by the sons of Jacob. And it may well be after that, that that caused Jacob to take stock of his life and of his family life. And I rather think that although Jacob recognised that um, the years which had passed hadn't really advanced his spiritual life, his spiritual life was one of defeat and retreat. And that's the context, that's kind of the background as we come to chapter 35 in the life of Jacob. And it's interesting because the text opens, as you see, God says to Jacob, go up to Bethel. I want you to go back to Bethel. And you remember earlier on, I'm sure, in the life of Jacob, um, and we looked at this last time, he um, by subterfuge and along with his mother's assistance, he took the birthright that uh, rightly belonged to his older brother Esau, although he had traded it in for a bowl of stew. But he took that and under subterfuge managed to have his father Isaac pass the birthright. Um, that right to re lead the family spiritually was passed on um to Jacob instead of to Esau. And when Esau learned about it, there was a threat, a threat to kill his brother. And as Jacob is escaping, he lies down on a stone pillow in Bethel and God appears to him. It's a very famous story. And God says to him, Jacob, I want you to go back to Bethel. Now, I don't think there's anything magical about the place or about the spot. Um, but I think God wanted to, him to go back to Bethel as a sort of aid memoir. He wanted to rekindle something that had taken place there in Jacob's life. I remember when we were young, um, the the hymn writer and songwriter of the day was a black man called Andrew Crouch. He's now no longer with us. He, he died some years ago. But he wrote a song that we used to sing, and the words went like this, Take me back, take me back, dear Lord, to the place where I first received you. And what Andrew Crouch was saying in the song, Lord, I want you to take me back 
to that point in my life where everything was fresh and new and exciting. I remember many years ago now, I was in Carubbers. I was a relatively young man, and some of you might remember Donald Cormack. I know he was known to many of you at Kelty. And there was a, a, a man there. He wouldn't have been terribly old, but he seemed old to me at the time, but I suspect he would be in his mid or late 30s. And he was someone that I think Donald knew from his past who had really gone astray and had evidently fallen spiritually. And I always remember Donald Cormack putting his arm round him and saying to him, brother, you need to go back to that day and time and moment when you first received the Lord Jesus. Go back there. Go back to those days. Remember those days and rekindle the flame that was lit in your life when you were first saved. And I rather think that that's what God was saying um, to Jacob. Jacob, I want you to go back to Bethel. And actually, you need to read back a few chapters um, to put this in its proper context. You remember Jacob had fleed. He'd gone to his mother's family, to his uncle Laban. He'd married, um, well, in fact, two of his cousins. The one he loved was Rachel, but he ended up um, being diddled there himself and ended up with two wives after serving his um, father-in-law Laban for 14 years. But the woman he really loved was Rachel. Um, and then he worked there. And you can read the story. It, it's a fascinating story how, um, despite all that Laban tried to do, and frankly, despite some of the trickery of Jacob, God blessed Jacob and he became a wealthy man there in the household of his father-in-law. But God back, I think it's in chapter 31, tells him to go back to Bethel. And uh, he sneaks off in the middle of the night. Laban comes chasing him. There has to be a deal struck. And it's interesting because one of the things that um, had upset Laban was apparently Laban thought that Jacob had stolen some of his household gods, which he hadn't done. But in fact, if you read the story, what had happened was his favourite wife, Rachel, had actually hidden them in her saddlebags. And she hid them from her father. And those idols were carried from Padam Aram, where Laban lived, back to Bethel. So it's interesting as we read this story about Abram's journey back to Bethel. Look, what's the first thing that God asks him to do? In fact, what's the first thing that Jacob does? In verse 2, he says to his households, get rid of your foreign gods. And I think as perhaps somebody here in, uh, or in Jacob's life as, as an older man, and he looked back at some of his spiritual failures, he realized that some of the things that had to go was some of the foreign gods. You know, I think it's true that it's very easy, even for those of us as believers, to have our idols, maybe not little stone statues or wooden carvings, likes of which Rachel was hiding from her father, but there are other gods of this age. And we might think we can hide our idols, but they always appear. They always manifest themselves in some way. If it's money, if money is our idol, it will manifest itself in, Greek, in, in greed. If it's our possessions, it's interesting, very often, um, if our idols are our possessions, then the emotion that's often manifested is our fear. I remember many, well, it's not so many years ago now, but when you'll remember it at the banking collapse, um, small businesses, the likes of which I was involved in, um, suddenly the income stream just, just ceased. It was an absolutely extraordinary time for those of us who were in business. 
And uh, I remember going home and saying to Leslie, I'm, 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 I'm not sure what's going to happen now. And I said to her, you know, we could well lose our home over this. At the time, we still had a mortgage. We still had to have income coming in to pay our bills. Um, we still, as I recollected, a couple of our kids at home and all of that. And I did wonder what was going to happen. And, you know, it's strange, but the biggest emotion I faced was fear. And um, my wife is much more spiritual than I am. And she kind of shrugged her shoulders and said, well, if we lose the house, so what? You know, one day we're going to leave all of this behind anyway. But it was a fear when I analyze it looking back now, a fear of losing things, losing possessions. And if possessions are our idol, then ultimately it will express itself in fear. Sometimes our idol is our reputation, and usually that comes out in pride. Sometimes it's physical satisfaction that's our idol, and that usually results in immorality. And, you know, as our energies wax in the um, direction of our idols, so our love for God will wane, and it's always so. And if we've got idols that lie hidden somewhere, then for sure they will manifest themselves in our lives. And before Jacob went back to Bethel, I think it's interesting that God gave him some insight. Jacob, you have to deal with your idols. You have to deal with your spiritual failure. And we read that those idols came out. It's interesting that the family earrings also, that seemed to have something to do with their idolatry. Um, they also had to, to come out of their ears. And we read that he buried them under the oak at Shechem. Shechem was that place of shame, I think, for Jacob. But he buried his idols there so that he could um, move on. And I think it's interesting that what was true for Jacob, he recognized had to be true for his family. He said to his family, and perhaps particularly to his favorite wife, Rachel, Rachel, the idols have got to go. It was um, uh, something that I think he turned a blind eye to, but he realized he had to address and, right, and, and it may be that Jacob was in the position of being a backslider, someone who at that old, in, in his youth at Bethel, encountered God, but realized God was sending him back there to renew his relationship with him. And Jacob naturally wanted his children there too. And maybe for the first time in his life, although as we see later on in the chapter, perhaps inadequately, he took the lead with the family and said, let's bury our idols. And his family had to see that sincerity. And, you know, sometimes it said, you know, the family altar is the thing that really matters. And no doubt Jacob had his family altar, but it's the way we live before our children that counts most of all what our children need to see from us is a consistent spiritual life. So as he goes back to Bethel, could I suggest the first thing that was needed for God in his old age to restore his presence was a cleansing. There needed to be a purity. There needed to be setting aside of his idols. Now, it's very easy as we get into our old age to think, well, you know, those aren't issues for me. But for those of us that are older, can I suggest that we search our hearts and in the years that lie ahead, ask God to cleanse us from every idol and to take us back to Bethel. Now, as he goes back to Bethel, it's interesting because in verse um, seven, we read that he builds an altar and he calls the place not Bethel, but 
El Bethel. Now, you'll know Bethel means, well, the word Beth means house. El is God. So the Hebrew here is very straightforward. Bethel is the house of God. But now as Jacob returns there for a second time, note the name he gives now. It's El Bethel. And you don't need me to translate that for you now. It's God of the house of Bethel. Now, it's interesting that in his youth, Jacob's focus was on the place and what happened in the place. But he renames it El Bethel, God of the house of God. And could I suggest this, that in his youth, Jacob was possessed by the place. But now he is possessed by the person. He was possessed by the place where he met God, but now he is possessed by the person of God. And I think particularly in our youth, our eyes are on the altar. What do I mean by that? The altar... <coughs> needs to be built. But very often in the vigour of youth, it's the ministry. We enjoy preaching about him rather than enjoying God himself. And I think one of the benefits of old age, and there are more than one, but I think as the vigour of youth goes, there can be in our old age a turning and a greater focus and God himself. And very often, of course, for those of us who are getting older, we, we hanker and long after for the vigour of youth. Of course we do. But as these things that we do inevitably as we get older have to be set aside and we have to pass on the baton to others, it's an opportunity to refocus on El Bethel, the God of the house of God. I think very often God wants us to love him and not just love his work. Sometimes it's the work of God that we enjoy rather than God himself. But ultimately, God must be our focus. He is the El Bethel. So the first thing I think that we see there is as we get into our old age, we have to be careful and remember that there's still a time of cleansing, dealing with our false gods that maybe we've accumulated over our lives and a refocusing on God himself. But there's another aspect, I think, to old age that... Um, emerges in this passage. Did you see it? There are three deaths. And uh, one of the um, things that you do as you get older, at least I, I, I've always been a, a reader of the local rag, the Scotsman newspaper. And I always like to say to younger people, I remember I used to buy the Scotsman and, and I, I bought it to check the engagements because in those far off days, it was the custom that if you got engaged, you announced your engagement in the newspaper. And I would check the engagements to see people that I knew who were um, getting engaged. Then things would move on. And then I'd be checking the marriages. And uh, again, it was customary when you got married to announce your marriage in the paper. Then it was the births. And uh, the births of all our children went into the Scotsman. And I'm afraid I've reached the stage where, um, as I usually say to Leslie in the morning, as I'm checking the papers, right, let's see if I'm still living. Because I'm afraid what I'm now checking is the deaths. And one of the things, as we get older, let's face it, death is something we face. We we, we lose friends and, there are, and, and, and um, parents. And spouses, 
And uh, it's interesting, there are three deaths um, that occur in this chapter. The first one is in verse 8. And uh, it says that it was Deborah, Rebecca's nurse, who died. And it's likely some of the commentators say that here is a lady that um, Jacob grew up with. And it, it's not clear just how she ended up being part of Jacob's household. But it seems at this stage in her life, there she was. And it may be after um, the death of Jacob's mother, Rebecca, that Deborah was brought into Jacob's household. And someone su suggested that this lady was someone who maybe gave about 150 years of service to this family. It was somebody that Jacob knew intimately and knew well. And in fact, the, the scripture records that she's buried under the oak below Bethel. And there's a name given, which means, which is Alan Bekuth, which means the oak of weeping. And it seems certainly that the, the text suggests that this loss was huge for Jacob. And we all know as we get into our older years what that feels like, the sorrow of losing someone that's been near and dear to our family. And then, of course, we read later on in the chapter, the greatest sorrow of Jacob's life. Um, and uh, that was the death of his wife, Rachel. And as she's giving birth to Benjamin, she dies. And she's going to give the boy the name Ben-Omi, which means son of my troubles. Um, but Jacob won't have that and renames him Benjamin, son of my right hand, the, 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 which was a position of privilege. And then right at the end of the chapter, we read of the death of Isaac, Jacob's father. So right in this chapter, it's blow after blow, the death of Deborah and the sorrow that that brought. And that would have been one type of sorrow, the sorrow of the loss of a close friend of the family. And then there's the loss of his spouse, the love of his life. And that, again, would be a sorrow, a different kind of sorrow from Deborah, but a sorrow nevertheless. And then, of course, there's the death of his father. Again, another sorrow. I, I think, though, you would agree with me, a different type of sorrow. The sorrow of a loss of a family friend, the loss of a spouse, the loss of a parent. And these great sorrows, as Jacob enters into his latter years, emerge from the chapter. And yet I think on top of that, there's also great comfort. Because if we look at, at just after the, the death of, Je of, of Deborah in verse 11, in fact, at verse 9, it says, After Jacob returned from Pad Padam Aram, God appeared to him and blessed him. And God said to him, Your name is Jacob, but you will no longer be called Jacob. Your name will be Israel. So he named him Israel. And God said to him, I'm God Almighty, be fruitful and increase in number. A nation and a community of nations will come from you. Kings will come from your body. The land I gave to Abram and Isaac, I also give to you. And I will give this land to your descendants after you. Now, the interesting thing about that is there's nothing new here. God back at the back at the at the at the, at the sorry, at the brook Jabbok. God renamed Jacob Israel. He's just telling him something he already knew. And uh, again, in verses 11 and 12, as God renews that covenant with Jacob, all of this was truth that Jacob had already been given. And God, in these sorrows, it seems to me what he says to Jacob is just renew the promises that he's already given to him. I'm reminded of that text in Psalm 37. I have been young and now I'm old, yet I've not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. And I think what God was saying to Jacob, look, as all these shifting sands are moving in your life, 
as a friend dies, as a spouse dies, as a father dies, I just want you to be reminded that the promises I have made to you remain good. And of course, what God promises him is that there is a future, that God's purpose will be worked out. And it's interesting that amongst those deaths, we have, I think, the first time in the scripture, the record is given in one section of the 12 sons of Jacob there in verses 23 um, to 26. These were the sons of Jacob, we are told. There is a future. And of course, there is, I think, another little detail that's written in here that Jacob could never have known that the place where Rachel died was Bethlehem. And we know something that Jacob didn't know, that Bethlehem would be a place of birth and of hope, that that great king that would come from Jacob's body, the everlasting king, would be born in the very place where Rachel is buried. And surely the Lord is telling us that as we lose loved ones, as we have to inevitably, as we grow old, face the loss of friends, face the loss of spouses, face the loss of parents, that God's purpose is being worked out and there is a great hope because not because of the one who is buried in Bethlehem but because of the one who was born in Bethlehem and who died for us and who rose again and therefore we know that death is not the end and therefore can I suggest the great lesson there that God was teaching Jacob was that we can trust him and his promises are sure. God doesn't give him any more revelation in his old age. In fact, I think this is the last recorded time in the, li in the life of Jacob that God appears to him. And what does he do? He doesn't give him any new information, no new promises. He just reminds him of things that he already knew that um, God would take care of him, would bless him, and that God's plan and purpose goes on despite our sorrows, we can trust him. So those are just three little points from the life of Jacob, particularly, I think, for those of us who are, well, like me, we've got a few grey hairs that we, even in our later years, think, Lord, what idols are there that I need to deal with? And that maybe in front of my family, I need to deal with. And Lord, give me a new focus, not on the places. And let's face it, we do that in our old age. We remember the church we went to. We, met, we remember the old mission hall. We remember the old songs. We remember these things, but God wants us not to focus on the place, but on himself. And finally, remember that even in the great sorrows that old age can bring, we can trust God. And we know that the place of death, which was Bethlehem for Jacob, became the place of birth and of hope. And that hope in the Lord Jesus and in his coming, of course, is our great hope that we carry through all of life and particularly into our later years. So may God bless us as we think about these things, about our need for cleansing, our need for focus, and that we can trust him in all of our sorrows and completely with our future. So let me just pray for you, and then I'll hand back to John. Father, we thank you again for your great word and these great promises, and particularly, Lord, for those of us who are older,
And we recognize, Lord, as we face the last laps, that some of these are the hardest. And some of these create in us and bring indeed the greatest of sorrows. And yet, Lord, we thank you for the hope that knowing you brings. We thank you, Lord, for the hope of Bethlehem. We thank you, Lord, that we can look forward knowing that your ultimate plan and purpose, that the kings that would come from Jacob's line, indeed the king, is our king who secures our hope and our future. So, Lord, bless this word to all our hearts. Help us, Lord, to live in the strength of these things in all the days that remain, whether they be days of sorrow or days of joy or days of blessing. May we, Lord, rejoice in your great promises. And we ask these things in and through the name of the Lord Jesus and giving him all of the glory. Amen.